Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I hope everybody's doing well tonight. Uh, I want to share some scriptures that I, I believe the Lord has been speaking to me for the past few days <clears throat> about waiting. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 18, verses 18 through 25. I'm going to read it from the English Standard Version and then from the Message Bible. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that it is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now this is how it says in the Message Bible. That's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good time. I like that. The created world itself can hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God reigns it in until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, the joyful anticipation deepens. All around us we observe a pregnant creation. The difficult times of pain throughout the world are simply birth pangs. But it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We're also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and bar barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we become, and the more joyful our expectancy. <clears throat> For the past week and a half, I have been feeling or, or sensing these things in the spirit. And I feel it's because my connection to God is growing and it's increasing and it's deepening and, and getting stronger. And on Sunday, I experienced something in here that I have never experienced before. And, and I'm starting to hear what he's telling me more clearly to the point that I can make an entire message, you know, in, in, in my spirit. And, and, you know, I, I feel like I'm increasing in size. And I read this and when I, when I got this scripture, I was in my house, you know, I, I opened this, this Bible app and this is the first thing that showed up when I mm -hmm. opened it. Mm -hmm. And I read it and I, and I said, okay, I know this is what you are, have been trying to tell me, God, for a while now. That I have to continue to wait on you, continue to be patient, and continue to grow on you, with you, you know, with you in me, so that when you reveal everything that you want to reveal to me nothing else in the world is going to matter because it's going to be the greatest thing that I'm going to know or experience and while I was reading this earlier today I started looking for 
something that will say that God does not disappoint us. And I searched and searched, and every single entry that I found on the uh, search engine pointed to the same scripture. Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. And I want to read that to you. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope, hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. I believe that the hunger that we have been talking about for the past few weeks continues to grow. And I see people around me or in, in social media that people are now being more open to share scriptures with other people, messages that they feel in one way or another relate to the word of God. And that is because they're looking for something. Yeah. And they know that the only place they're going to find it is in the word that God gave us. Yeah. That's what I want to share. Yeah. Anyone wants to share anything? Any prayer requests? Thank you for what you've done, what you've done for the next group.
stand. Thank you, Father. We come to you today and we present all of our cares upon you. Father, we believe in the word that you have given us. It is the word that gives us peace. It gives us understanding. It gives us wisdom. And in that word, Lord, you give us your promises. Promises that we are going to be saved promises that we are going to be healed, Lord, that we are going to be prosperous, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, Lord, that you will be with us every step of the way. Right now, Father, we lift up all of those that are in need of healing, Sally, Allison, Tammy, Laura. We believe, Lord, that you are going to deliver them from whatever it is from this world that is oppressing them right now. Those that could not be here, keep them safe, Lord, whether it's because of the journey that they're taking or because they cannot make it here or because of things in the world are keeping them from coming. We know that your hand is upon them, that you're keeping them safe, you're keeping them protected, and you continue to pour your grace over all of us, Lord. So we thank you, Father, for the ultimate sacrifice that you made here by giving your only son to die for work of the cross when Jesus said it is finished. Everything was finished in the spirit of God. And now we speak those things that you say to make sure that they manifest in this physical realm. We thank you, Father. We magnify you, we glorify you, we praise you, we worship you. Let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak with new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. Thank you, Lord. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, John. <laughs> Would you uh, do us the honor, please, for the offering? Thank you. Good to see you, brother.
Let's worship and enter into his presence.
Fill our praise, fill our praise. Let your presence fill this place. Come and let your presence fill our praise, fill our praise. Come and let your presence fill.
Sit where two or three are gathered, there you are, Lord. You are. And let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise. as you want consume this heart that longs to burn I know your fire can hurt but I will be worse here without you for I
come and take all these chains that get in the way of what you want. And as I stand in the flame, still I will say I trust you, God. Yes, I will trust you. you're approving of what I say and I do. Cause nothing really satisfies like when you speak my name. So tell me that you'll never leave. And everything will be okay in your presence. And all fear is gone in your presence. In your presence is where. Yes, Father, I am waiting 
I need to hear from you to know that you're approving of what I say and do cause nothing really satisfies like when you speak my Everything will be okay in your presence. All fear is gone in your presence. In your presence is where I belong. In your presence. In your presence. Somewhere on this journey, I think I've lost hold of the truth. Cause nothing really satisfies like when you speak my name. So tell me that. distracted with yes. situations and circumstances, even religion. Yes. But what the Lord's always doing is trying to recenter us on Him. I just was thinking while we were worshiping how good the Lord really is. I mean, He loves us so much. It's such a personal thing. And all He's asking for us is to look to Him. For anything and everything. And he won't leave us or forsake us. He's a loving God. Hallelujah. All the time. Yes. The highest priority of his is to love. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I was thinking, Roberto was saying as well, that everything about the Lord Sometimes it looks like trials. They're, they're not coming from him. They happen because of the world that we live in. Yes, but yet he uses them. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And he uses them for one purpose, and that's to increase our faith. Because the greater our faith, the greater we can receive. He wants to pour out all of his blessings. He's done everything 
that needs to be done for us to have everything that we could ever want, hope, or desire, even beyond our imagination. Hallelujah. But we have to get it by faith. And so he's always in the process of building our faith. Whatever the devil throws at us, he uses as a faith builder. And it's been that way from day one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Glory. There's, not, there's nothing, you know, I, you have to just say it, there's nothing negative in God. There's plenty of negative in the world. There's plenty of negative from the devil. But there is absolutely nothing negative about God. He's a positive God. Always healing. Amen. Blessing, prospering. It's always positive. The negative always comes either through the world, through other people, through the enemy himself, through our own imaginations, not in agreement with the word. But if we look to him, it's always going to be a positive outcome, no matter what the circumstances look like. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, praise the Lord, about faith, but in a roundabout way how even under the Old Testament, they didn't live by faith, they lived by rules and regulations, mm -hmm. but God was trying to teach them faith yeah. all the time. Yeah. Because even then, he knew they weren't going to keep the rules. They weren't going to get anything from him by keeping rules because they were continuously failing. Mm -hmm. So he was always trying to show them how to establish faith. Yes. Yes. Because it's only through faith, like Abraham, he received the promises. Yeah. By faith, you know, Moses saw Jesus, yeah. saw the glory of God, got the promise from him. So mm -hmm. uh, every prophet, every king yes. that served the Lord throughout the Old Testament operated to some, in some level by faith. Even when you read about Elijah, mm -hmm. you know, he was bummed out because his faith just wasn't there. What does God do? He tries to increase his faith. He doesn't give him more rules. He doesn't give him th more things to do. He just tries to give him something to focus his faith on yeah. so that he could see what God was doing in his situation and his circumstance. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to thank everybody for your prayers for Sally and uh, continues uh, prayers. Appreciate it. It has had an impact, tremendous impact. She's doing much better. I mean, you know, you don't realize what all happens here, but in the hospital they're talking about the possibility of kidney failure, heart problems, uh, all these other things. All of that was cool. None of it happened yeah. uh, in spite of what the prognosis and, and the fears that they monger, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, nevertheless, the, you know, the, the uh, pneumonia does have, take a toll. It just, it's, it's exhausting. It's like the worst case of the flu or a cold you can have. It just, it just takes everything out of you. But, uh, you know, based on what they told us at the at the uh, clinic and what they first told us at the hospital, uh, we had a miracle. Yeah. I mean, it's just this yeah. is the best scenario, you know, mm -hmm. based on what what it looked like in the in the beginning. So Amen. I'm grateful to all of you for praying, and uh, I appreciate you, uh, pr uh, you know, respecting her uh, privacy. She just didn't want company. She was exhausted. She was out of her head most of the time. I mean, more than usual, more than she normally is. I mean, she just didn't, she couldn't focus, she couldn't keep a train of thought or anything, and she just, uh, what she needed more than anything else was the, the rest and, and your prayers, and I appreciate that from all of you. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Uh, we can move uh, the hands of God, you know, to use a, a symbol here. I mean, he's already moved. But we can manifest with two people as much as you can do with a thousand. So God is not a respecter of persons nor crowds. You know, he just, 
where, that's why he tells us wherever two or three are gathered together. God's there, and he's going to move, and wherever God is, miracles happen. It's just automatic. So, again, thank you, everybody, for your prayers. Appreciate it so much, and I believe uh, Friday we're going to get an even more positive report. And expect to see her back here soon. Praise the Lord. Also, I want to thank everybody uh, for continuing on just as normal. Uh, even though I wasn't here, thanks, Mark, for a great uh, message Sunday. I did get to watch it. Did a great job. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Roberto, uh, Wednesday night. I didn't get to watch it live Wednesday because I was at the hospital, but I did get to see the, the replay, so to speak. Excellent work. And uh, Mike, as always, your faithfulness is a tremendous blessing to Sally and I both and, and to the whole church for that matter. So anyway, thanks, everybody. Appreciate you just hanging in there and doing your thing. And Praise the Lord. the Lord. Amen. So I want to just uh, move through this tonight and just talk about just keeping your mind uh, that the focus here is about faith because it always has been. You know, uh, God's, God is going to do something supernaturally Phenomenal, I believe, in this church. And, uh, you know, every time you, you know, well, I don't care if it's sickness, if it's, uh, we all have challenges. You know, it's either one thing or the other. And just the group of us that are here tonight, all of us could share things that are going on in their life right now that are not positive, that are not, you know, uplifting, if you will. But God is in the midst of these things. I don't care how bad it looks. We have to see God in the midst of it. We have to believe that in this, his plan will be, I mean, the cross looks like a defeat. You know, Jesus uh, in the garden, it looks like the enemy got the best of him. John the Baptist. I mean, all these, you could go down the whole list of the Bible, and it always looks like, from the natural perspective, that this isn't right. This, this can't be the way it's supposed to be. And yet, each time, we see victory without fail. I mean, without uh, exception, it's always victory. Even when you read the book of Revelations out of context, if you will, it's still a victory. I mean, even if you read it in the fear kind of mode that we've had over the years, even then it's still a victory. We still win. No matter whether you're pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, you still win. It's just a lot of junk. But in all of that junk, God perfects and works miracles and, uh, and, in, and encourages us to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So, look, if you think you're going to get through this without having to exercise faith, you're mistaken. You've misunderstood the Bible. He's a God of faith. We, we can't even come to God. We wouldn't even believe that there was a God if we didn't have faith to begin with. The very initial step of coming to salvation, that, to believe that there's a God, takes faith. Everything in the kingdom of God, everything about our relationship with God is a faith-based relationship, faith-based exercise in relationship. So uh, this is the... This is the plan that God has throughout the Bible is to teach us how to live by faith. Even under the old covenant, when they lived, really, they didn't live by faith, but he was still trying to bring them to a place of faith. Anytime God moved, it was a question of, of, of faith. I mean, just think about, uh, he used situations, circumstances, he used things that they could see. Even now, uh, you know, a lot of times, I can't tell you how, how, uh, awesome it would be to hear the audible voice of the Lord. It rarely happens. It rarely happens. And if you understand it from the perspective of the Bible, it's a lesser miracle. That's something that he did under the old covenant when they didn't have the Spirit of God to lead them. 
when God couldn't speak to their heart, to the inner man, and lead them by unction of the Holy Spirit. We still are kind of that way. We want to see things so that we can believe. But that's not faith. God did that under the old covenant because they didn't live by faith. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to lead them and to guide them. They, they didn't have the, the same opportunities, the same uh, completed understanding of the Word of God. So there was no way uh, that they would respond without some sort of external sign. But this is not an external walk that we have with God. It's an internal thing. It's something that's done by the Spirit. Now, there are external manifestations, but if we're looking for manifestation, uh, we're missing the, the, in, the internal growth that God is trying to create in our lives. That will change the manifestation. The problem is we always have the cart before the horse, or the vast majority of the time, looking for manifestation without developing the supernatural, spiritual aspect of this, which produces the manifestation. It's almost like an oxymoron, but, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you can't live by manifestation because it doesn't take long before, if you have a manifestation, we've seen this all in, in all sorts of uh, different venues, but in revivals and different things, where God would do something autonomously. S people would be slain in the Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit would fall and people would be speaking in tongues. Uh, whatever it might have been, healings, just would, just God would do it. And then immediately, man wants to step in and have manifestation. So they start doing things so that they can get the manifestation. When all it was in the first place where people came into the presence of God and had faith in that presence, and God did stuff. Amen. So they weren't necessarily, at the time, they weren't necessarily looking for a manifestation in terms of healing or this or specific thing. They were looking for the presence of God just like this last song we sang. And in his presence, you see, fullness of joy. All things, everything happens, everything works that way. Amen. So, uh, praise the Lord. I, I, let's move on. Uh, Luke chapter 24 and verse 27. I'm just gonna read two scriptures here to start. I'm not gonna use a whole lot of scripture tonight because I just wanna teach some things and uh, uh, help us to kind of reset uh, our thinking in this relationship and the way that God is moving. It's really easy when you're going through a long-term trial. Now, I'm not speaking personally here at the moment, although I've had my share of them over the years. Uh, and to some degree, I suppose I still have, you know, based on expectation and manifestation, if you will. I mean, just look. And uh, so it can be a bummer if you let it be a bummer. You know what I mean? It can just consume you. Uh, but God has a plan yes. and as Roberto so rightly said it, in the process of this it, it, isn't, it isn't like okay God says I want you to have patience it's just a process it's just part of what happens patience will come out of it I mean you, you, either, you, either you'll become patient or you'll blow your brains out you know honestly you you're going to either trust God and it'll develop patience through that or you'll quit trusting God and you'll just flip out and do something crazy. So, but I think, I, I find it interesting that this is patience then uh, creates or brings about character. And what was the next thing after character? Hope. Now, I never, in the natural, I just never equate character with hope. They don't seem to be, you know, connected. But what character? She is the character of God. That we have patience. In other words, we trust him regardless of what's happening, regardless of what manifestation we're seeing right at the moment. We're trusting God. We have the character of God, which is faith. And that character produces hope. And hope, then, it isn't hope like the world hopes. Jeez, I hope something happens. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. No, it's hope in God. It's hope in God. It's a positive hope. Not a crapshoot, but an expectation. Abraham hoped when there was no hope. You know what I'm saying? When there was no natural hope, he still had hope. It, why? 
because he didn't uh, consider his body being 100 years old, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. He just believed. And the miracle happened, just as God said it would. He hoped in the promise of God in spite of the fact that there really was nothing to hope in, in the natural. Right? After a while, you're going through stuff. In the natural, you say, well, I'm still hoping. And people are going, you're nuts. You know, you, sh you should have figured this out by now. No, you've developed a patience that has created a God characteristic in you, character, that has produced hope, a hope in God. That will make manifestation. It will cause manifestation. Amen? So in, in the beginning, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things consider, concerning himself. So, again, we're talking about... Uh, how everything in the scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God's profitable for instruction, correction, and so forth, and righteousness. But it's all about Jesus. It's all about a manifestation or a visualization or a revelation of Jesus. That's the entire Bible. That's what it's for. Because that's the hope. That's the hope of the world. That's the promise. That's the guarantee of everything else that we're dealing with in our life, regardless of whatever it might be. All right? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. He did this, talking about in the Old Testament. See, he was, he was doing this even under the law, even before the law, praise the Lord. So this is Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached, it was the gospel of grace, the gospel of God's favor toward man, as well as unto them. Amen. He's talking about under the Old Covenant. But the word preached did not profit them, why? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. The only difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is faith. And I'll, I'll show you tonight. It, we think of the Old Testament as being a, almost like a different religion. It's not. It's the very same thing. So, how, how many of you all heard the expression, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? Why? Because pictures help us remember. We think in pictures. We don't think in words. If I say uh, dog, you don't see D-O-G. <laughs> you see a dog. You see some dog that you remember, you know, like a German Shepherd, a Pekingese, a Poodle, something. Some dog just comes into your mind, right? It's, it's the way that humans are designed. We, uh, it, helps us, it helps us to remember. It helps us to understand. Remember when you were a kid going to school and they'd, they'd always have word problems, but they'd give them to you with pictures so you could understand, so you could grasp what the real issue was that you were dealing with instead of just a bunch of explanation, you know. And they also help, pictures also help us to look forward. So if you want to remember an event, let's say you want to remember uh, your wedding. You normally don't go to your journal or your diary to look up comments from that. You, you get out a picture album, right? And it brings to mind, even emotions come back, feelings, all those kinds of things. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the way we work. If, if you want to uh, know how to build a swing set, how do you, how do you put it together? With the schematic, I, I hardly ever read the directions. I'm always looking at the picture. The directions always screw me up. But I can be looking at the Spanish section or the French. If I got the picture, I can still do it. I can still figure it out. Pictures are all the same in any language, right? Or if you, uh, if you want to go on a vacation, if you're picking a spot to go on vacation, I don't want to read the dictionary's definition of Belize. You know, I want some pictures. I want to know what's there. I want to know how big the mosquitoes are, how white the sand is on the beaches, how blue the water, whatever. You know, wherever I'm going, I want, I want pictures of what, what I'm going to do, right? Because it helps me to understand, help me to, help me to appreciate what it is. Images, they do that. And that's why in the Bible, God used so many pictures in the Old Testament. They had to see, they had to visualize what it was God was trying to tell them. They didn't have the spirit to, to 
decipher this stuff or to define it or to clarify it. So they had to have images. They had to have pictures. They had to have something. It's like the Passover lamb, like the flood, or like the tabernacle. They're all pictures. And they're pictures to help understand a greater truth. And that's why God used them. They helped Israel remember better, right? Helped them to understand better. And it helped them to look forward better. That was the point. Amen? Mm -hmm. So the study of how God used pictures is what typology is all about. We're always talking about typology. You do any kind of uh, preaching and you, you can't get away from it. You'll see it. You, you'll see it in all kinds of things. And I hear people testifying all the time. They're using typology, whether they know it or not, whether they're you know, consciously aware of it. They're using types all the time whether it's from a dream that God gave them or an experience that they had, they're, they're connecting mm -hmm. these types with the, the, the natural stuff that's happening, right? So God used this study of, uh, of pictures to teach his people. And that study of pictures is typology. That's what it is. And basically it means picturology. When, when, when we s prepare sermons... I mean, that's what I'm doing. You get a picture in your head. I mean, don't you? I mean, you think of David and Goliath. I don't just David and Goliath. I'm seeing this little guy with a slingshot and this big monster, you know. Or the flood, you know. You see the boat flop, you know. Uh, whatever. It's, you get a picture, and then from that picture, you try to make some kind of sense out of it, right? So it's, what it is is it's visual theology would be the way uh, you could describe it. See, God pictured the truth to preach the truth. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> he pictured truth so that he could preach the truth. Right. He gives them the tabernacle so he can give them the truth of what the tabernacle is all about. Mm -hmm. A picture is worth a thousand words. He could have tried to explain all of this in words, but they'd have never got it. Right. So he gives them pictures, right? All right, let's look at Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. Is that right? Is that Colossians 3, 17? Uh, try Galatians. Oh, wait a minute. Let me, let me just look. Ah, uh, sorry, 217. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. It's talking about the feast, uh, meat, drink, all of that, right? Which they're all nothing but a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. In other words, all of that stuff, all of the feasts, all of the celebrations, uh, anything that people were doing, eating, Drinking, not eating, not drinking. They were all simply a type or a shadow. And none of them had any real substance in themselves. They were all about, it was all about Jesus. It was trying to present a picture of Christ. In other words, it was trying to give God a physicalness, even under the Old Covenant. It was trying to make God visual so that they could have an image of God, so they could see God who was invisible, right? So here's the problem. Most people experience two problems, really, when it comes to typology. And the first is they don't do pictures very well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, you know, we're better at words. We're better at numbers, at reading, uh, math logic, because that's the way the world has gone in the 
world that we live in today especially. Humans like precision. They like clarity. They like the bottom line. You know what I mean? Anybody take an art class in college or school or anything? And you're trying to figure it out. And they're giving you all these different things about what it means. And you're, I, you know, I'll just put me in there. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, well, I just see that. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not getting it, you know. Uh, just tell me what it's supposed to mean and I'll be happy with that. So, you know, we just don't do that kind of thing real well as a rule. Uh, we like it to be quick and to the point. We don't do pictures. We don't do art. We don't do symbols, uh, metaphors, and poetry. We're, not, we're just not really good at that. Poetry has to rhyme or it's a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. I mean, once you get past limericks, I'm pretty much lost. And that's a big disadvantage when it comes to interpreting the Old Testament, the symbols and the metaphors that are there. So the second problem then is this thing puts us off even more, and that's the way typology has been abused by the church, the way it's been twisted around. And I can tell you, I've sat in plenty of services and heard lots and lots of sermons over the years, thousands of them. And most typology sermons are more like a weird abstract art picture of something, you know, that you have no clue what it is, rather than a Rembrandt, you know, or a, a you know, a, a naturalist kind of uh, painter. And so they just kind of start in the Old Testament, and then unpredictably and kind of radically and randomly they leap to the New Testament without any connection whatsoever, and you're going, how, how do we get here? I mean, what happened? What, what, is it, what are you trying to tell me, you know? I mean, what is the, what's the point of this? It, it's like it's irrational, some of the connections that I've heard made when it comes to the Old Testament law and New Testament grace. It's, you're going, my God. This is like looking at a Picasso, and, you, and they're saying that it's a, that's a woman with guitar, and you're saying, okay, you kind of see the guitar. Is that a woman? You know, the cubism and the whole thing. So, I mean, it's just like a leap of faith that, oh, that, okay, that's what he's doing. And you're thinking, geez, I could do that. I'm sure I could. Just give me a six-inch ruler, and I can start making triangles and squares and <laughs> put it in there, right? Okay, Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. So it's symbols, it's types that God was using to, to develop this truth, this reality. It's pictures, in other words, that he's trying to explain. So a type, what you have to understand is a type and this will help you eventually. I know it may be dry and you think, well, he's just going on here. But it'll help you when you read the Bible. Mm -hmm. A type is a real person. Mm -hmm. It's a real place. It's a real object or a real event that God ordained to act as a predictive pattern or a resemblance of Jesus. Uh, the person of Jesus, right? or a work of Jesus, or an opposition to both, or a fulfillment of both. That's what types are. They're real things. They're not made up stuff just so that you can then do something else. It's a real deal. It's a real person. It's a real place. It's a real thing that happened. It's a real event. It's a real office, you know. For example, the Passover lamb was a type of Jesus. That's a, everybody gets that, right? right? The Passover was a real event. Yeah. Amen? The truths of substitutionary sacrifice and redemption by blood 
they were found in both of those, weren't they? They were found in the Passover lamb, and they were found in Jesus. They're both real. I mean, the events that are surrounding them. So, uh, amen, there's, there, that's the type, and the anti-type, or in the place of the type, or the fulfillment of it. When I say anti-type, we're not talking about against it. We're saying, it's the, basically, it's the fulfillment, or in the place of that type, the fulfillment of it. Amen? Yes. Which, which is uh, the truth, amen, like are enlarged, or, or they're clarified. You see what I'm saying? Same truth, same real thing, except in the fulfillment, that truth is made clearer. It's, it's more obvious. It's, uh, it's enlarged, yeah. right? Yeah. It's like I got a picture on my uh, cell phone this morning. My daughter um, is uh, getting married in next week sometime in July, 4th and 3rd, 4th of July, somewhere like that. And uh, thank God she's got a good guy. He's really a good, decent person, and, and they're really happy, and I'm, I'm happy for him. Uh, but they, they're getting married in Missouri. He's got a lake home down there, and so they, were, they, they go down there a lot, and they're going to go to Missouri to get married. So they were on their way to get their license, so next week they can, they're getting married down there. And uh, she, they were kind of leaning against the front of the car, him and her, and she was holding a sign that says, it said, on our way to get Missouri marriage license. But I couldn't, I, I couldn't read it. All I could read was uh, Missouri marriage. I'm thinking, did they already get married? I asked Sally. I said, did they already get married? Now, that was a mistake because she, she's not sure what planet we're on, let alone where Missouri <laughs> is right now. But <laughs> then it came up on Facebook and my daughter had it, and then you, I could read it because it was, a, you know, it's on a bigger screen, and it, that's what it said, on our way to Missouri to get, or on our way to get the Missouri marriage license. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying. The fulfillment of typology, it, it isn't a different thing. It's a bigger, clearer understanding of that truth, okay? So uh, the fulfillment of the Passover was God in the flesh. Yes. The Passover lamb I'm talking about, yes. right? God, man, right? Mm -hmm. Not just a lamb, not just a spotless lamb that was had been picked over and made sure that it was all right, but it was man, God, man, right? Yes. So uh, you go from the spiritual, eternal bondage, not just physical, and temporary bondage. Got it? Under the old covenant, with the lamb, you had temporary bondage because it was only a temporary fix. Right? And it was just a physical thing. Right? When Jesus comes and you get the clear picture, you get the large, enlarged picture, the clearer picture, you find out that it's you're being redeemed from spiritual bondage and eternal bondage, right? So it, it just gets bigger. It's, a, it's a, a clearer picture of what it is. It's still true. Both are true, but this is a bigger picture of a greater, grander, amen, clearer uh, picture, okay? So, for example, uh, here's a type. Person, Adam, he's a type of Jesus, the representative man. Right? Mm -hmm. Then you have a, 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 uh, an object. The tabernacle is a type of God's dwelling with man through Christ. Okay? How about an event? We're talking about types here. Mm -hmm. Noah's flood is a picture of the prophecy of the destruction at the end of the world. Judgment comes. And those that are in Christ are saved. Those outside of Christ are lost. Right? Okay, office. An office. A prophet and the priest and the king under the old covenant. Those were the offices you had. You had prophets, you had priests, you had kings. Right? They were all anointed with oil to identify the fact that they had been selected and put in this position. Right? 
and all typified, all of that typified Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. That's what Messiah means. Mm -hmm. They were all pointing to him. They were all talking about him. Yep. Every one of them represent him. Now, uh, he, he was anointed with the Holy Ghost in order to be the greatest prophet, the greatest king, right? right. The high, our high priest. You see? It's just those were the types. They were real, real people, real times, real places. But the, they weren't what God was really trying to do was show them Jesus. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Now take it a step further, and it's also talking about us, who are heirs and joint heirs with Christ, who are also kings and priests, yeah. and told to prophesy. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So how are, the, how, how are these types designed to minister to the Old Testament people and their needs and then and edify them? Because it looks like we're dealing with two different things. Now, in hindsight, we look at it and go, oh, yeah, well, there, praise the Lord. But these poor slobs couldn't figure it out. There had to be a reason because all Scripture was given by inspiration of God and was profitable for everybody, not just for us. Yeah. Right? Okay, here's an example. The Passover taught the original Israelites some essential truth. First of all, that God's anger against sin is severe. Right. He hates sin. Right. And two, God's anger can be turned away by the sacrificial blood of a perfect substitute. Right. Trying to reveal God, you know, who, what the true nature of God is, right? Mm -hmm. So three, God grants safety only to those who are under the blood. Right. And four, God's salvation redeems from bondage. Yes. Yep. That's what he was teaching them. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. So today, you know, we're, we're skeptical about how much the Israelites understood these particular types because of their rejection of Jesus, because they rejected Christ, right? But as Old Testament revelation continued to unfold, the prophets increasingly recognized previous Old Testament events and people as types. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. But here's the purpose. The type only saved, and get this, the, the, the type only saved those who by faith, hear me? All of these things were works. All of these things were laws. But they only work for people that operated in faith. Right. That's why Jesus said, your father's the devil. He said, if you believe the way your father Abraham believed, you'd be justified. He said, none of you are justified by the law. Even under the old covenant, they were still justified by faith. He was trying to teach them faith. Because anybody under the old covenant that got a blessing, that got saved, that got delivered, that got set free, they, it happened by faith. Believe me, it didn't happen because of what they were doing or their necessarily their head knowledge of the event, right? Because as, as, as the purpose of those types was to bring people to faith. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? It only saved those who by faith saw the great future fulfillment. Right. You, could, you could slaughter lambs and sheep and goats from now till, till hell freezes over, and if you didn't exercise faith in the, what they were pointing to, it was a waste of time. Right. That's why God said it through David, off, sacrifice and offering I don't really want. But faith is what I'm looking for. Right. He says obedience, but what he's talking about is faith, coming to faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. The only way you can be obedient. You can't be, I mean, it would be ridiculous of God to demand faith, uh, obedience from people that he knew cannot do it. They, it's impossible for him. Right. What he's calling obedience is faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what David is saying, you know. Praise the Lord. So, Amen. John the Baptist. Let's look at uh, Matthew 11:11. Uh, 11, 11. So what I'm saying here is this: faith is the only thing. That's what God is after. And so every time the enemy comes against you with whatever, it's the opportunity for God. To increase your faith. Why? Because God wants you blessed. And the only way you can be blessed 
is by faith. That's what I'm showing you here under the Old Testament. There were people that got blessed. Look at David. Why? How did David get blessed? By faith. He's a murderer, an adulterer, uh, broke God's law many, many times in many different ways, and yet he believed to see the goodness of God. Yeah. And he did because he believed it, because he had faith in this goodness of God. He had faith in this grace, in this favor, in, in God's love and compassion. Amen. Praise the Lord. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Why? Because everything in the kingdom is by the Spirit, by faith. Whereas John the Baptist, he was exercising faith in the coming Messiah, or he wouldn't have done what he was doing, but he was very limited because he didn't have the Holy Spirit. His faith was small in comparison. That's the analogy that's being made here, okay? Now, uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 33. I mean, if you don't believe that, you know, he sent disciples, his, some of his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the one or should we be looking for somebody else? I mean, this is the guy that said, behold the Lamb of God. Now he's saying, wait a minute. Maybe I missed it. You know, maybe I, that wasn't it. And they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of Pharisees? But the, yours are eating and drinking. <laughs> Why? Because they didn't have the same revelation. They didn't operate by the same faith. They were still operating based on rules and laws that were types. The disciples are with the fulfillment of those types. It's kind of superfluous to be, you know, going through all the motions. This is what is so uh, bizarre about the, uh, the Judaizers, that you, you know, whatever you want to call them. I don't say that disparagingly. I'm just saying they, they want the prayer shawls and the, you know, the special you know, uh, meals and dietary regulations and, and uh, celebrate every Jewish festival and so on and so forth. Duh. I mean, it's all right here. I got Passover 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365. You know, I got the, you know, all the fasting that needs to be done has been done. I'm not saying don't fast. I'm not saying, you know, don't do the, I'm just saying don't do them for the wrong reasons. You know, don't think that they're going to somehow make you spiritual or give you a better connection with God. They may help to cleanse you, may give you a clearer uh, focus on what you're trying to do and, and get the direction from God, but they're not going to make God and you any more close. Come on. You're one. You can't get closer than that. Right. I mean, you're one flesh. You're, you're one thing. Amen? So that's, what the, that's the point of this. Those were types. Those were shadows. Those were uh, symbols, metaphors. But Jesus is here now, right? So they trusted in the Messiah without completely knowing all the details of how that fulfillment would finally come. See, they were trusting in the Messiah. They just didn't know how this is going to come about. Right? I'm, what I'm saying is, they, if, if, they were, if they were saved, they were, they were operating by faith. They were, their faith was in the fact that God was going to do what God said he was going to do. If it took one day, two days, ten years, two thousand years. And that faith created a connection with God that could not be broken. That's why when Jesus went into hell, he didn't go down to hell to preach to those people who didn't believe. Remember, hell was just one big place. You know, Gehenna, and then there was, but there was a gulf there. And he went down to talk to those who had believed. He didn't go down to condemn those that had already been condemned. They were already lost. What was preaching to them going to do? Huh? It's like beating a dead horse, right? There's not going to be any preaching in hell. It's too late for people that are in hell to be preached to. He went to hell to the place of paradise, which was all part of hell. You know, we think that hell is just this horrible place. Well, it wasn't originally. It was where all the dead went. But there was a separation for the, for the wicked and the righteous. But it was all called the same thing. Jesus went there to, to take the captives captive to take those who had faith in Christ, had faith in this coming Messiah, 
throughout all the Old Testament, whatever that meant, faith in the sacrifices, faith in the one true God before the law, faith in what those laws represented under the Old Covenant, and he took them out. Amen? Praise the Lord. That's, that's, they were faithful people. People that operated in faith. That's why he tells them, and there's a place in the, in the New Testament where he says, I, the, the particular scripture escapes me at the moment, but Jesus says, and I'll just paraphrase it, he says, look, uh, if you, if you, the, the only, every, in other words, here's, here's the bottom line. Everybody that goes to heaven goes to heaven the same way. By faith. So he says there's neither Jew nor Greek nor Gentile. There's, there's no such thing as a Christian religion and an Old Testament religion. There's just one religion, if you want to call it a religion, and that's faith in God. Faith in the promises of God. That's what saves. That's what saved under the Old Covenant. You were not saved because you sacrificed enough animals. You were saved because you believed that those sacrifices pointed to the one sacrifice, Amen. God himself. Yes. You were simply putting trust in what God had said, yes. not in what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And anything other than that was a waste of time. Right. And that's why Jesus rebukes the Pharisees. He says, you're, you're, you have the, your, your confidence is in the tradition of men. Right. You frustrate God, his grace. Why? By believing in the act rather than what the act represents. Because the act doesn't require faith. It just requires obedience, doing it. But the act was only there to increase faith so that they could be saved. Every miracle ever happened, happened because of faith. Didn't happen because they were more righteous or did more things or whatever. They got enough of an understanding of what that type was that they put faith in God. And the result was God did what he says he'd do, right? So they trusted in the Messiah, that he was going to come. And so they were saved and received forgiveness even before Jesus showed up. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because God saw them no different then than he sees us today. He sees the end from the beginning. He sees faith, period. Hallelujah. Amen. Hebrews 10, uh, verses 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased be, to be offered because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more consciousness of sin. The reason they continued having sacrifices was, first of all, the sacrifices themselves did nothing. It was their faith in what those sacrifices were pointing to. The reason they were done over and over and over was to get people to start trusting, mm -hmm. having faith. It's like the flashcards when you were in second grade, and they, they're showing you that 3 plus 3 is... Six. Most of us don't know, never really understood the three and three is six. We just understood, we saw it enough times that you just identify three, three, six, right? Four, three, seven. You know, it's just the flashcards. I mean, I don't know about what it was for some of you, but that's what it was when I was a kid. That's the way you learned math. You just, you learned it to where it was natural, and then you could go forward into the more abstract kind of stuff, right? Like algebra and trigonometry and all that kind of stuff. But you had to have the basics. Right? And it came by pictures. Almost everything did. Phonics, all that stuff. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of this sin every year. For it is not possible that blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It seems like, well, then why did we even bother with it? Because it wasn't about taking away your sins. It was about getting you to have faith in God, who is the only one that can deal with your sin. Praise the Lord. So, Christ did it as he met them through symbolism. He saved them 
because he met them, he came to them through the metaphor, through the symbolism of those animal sacrifices. Right? You know, that's why he tells us the blood of bulls and goats, they don't do anything. They're not, they, they, don't, they don't accomplish anything. Their only purpose was to point people to put their faith in God. Then God does it just like that. The perfect, amen, fulfillment of the type. Okay, for example, you got to have a perfect fulfillment. Otherwise, it doesn't, none, it's worthless to even have a type. It's not really a type unless there is some perfect fulfillment of that type. So, for example, you got Goliath opposes David, right? Now, uh, that, that's a type of something, I'm sure, something good and something evil, right? And it would later be revealed in the fulfillment as the devil opposing the son of David, Jesus. Now, it was a real deal. It really did happen. But it was as much about people seeing the symbolism there of evil against good, this giant, massive evil against what looks like weak, you know, hanging on a cross. You've got the whole evil, violent world that's under the dominion of Satan. And you've got this one weak guy hanging on a tree. Weak in the sense of, of his natural ability to be able to combat this evil. And yet he wins. He's victorious. And not only is he victorious, he makes everybody else victorious. The entire Israeli people are winners. Praise the Lord. So uh, that's that's the that's the type uh, of of David's obedience to God, belief in God. Right when no one else could quite do it, you know, when nobody else was quite there. So how about Jonah? Jonah is the type of Jesus in his sufferings, in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what was. That's why it was there. Now, it was a real thing. It really happened. But it was really there about Jesus. The bigger picture, the, the, the clearer picture, was about Christ. Amen? And repentance. Now, look. Get this. Think about it. We think Jonah was mad. You know why Jonah was mad? Because the only repentance God was asking for was them to change their mind about him. Right. That he wasn't bad, that he wasn't mean, that he wasn't horrible. He just wanted to love them. He just wanted to save them, but they were going to have to turn. And they did. Yeah. What did they do? Sacrifice. The sacrifices were meaningless. Except they understood something about that type. They were exercising faith in a good God. And we know that because of that, Nineveh was spared for, I forget it is, a thousand years or something, you know, whatever it was. And Jonah was mad. Why? Because being the religious person he was, he wanted them to pay. He wasn't trying to produce faith. He just wanted, uh, you know, the, the, the Jews saved and everybody else can go to hell. That's where they belong anyway. Right? He didn't understand, he didn't understand really the metaphor, the type, as well as the people of Nineveh did. Or he wouldn't have been upset. He wouldn't have tried to run away. But in spite of that, God uses it as a type for us. And for all succeeding generations, not just for us, but for everyone who ever read the story of Noah or, or heard it or anything else, it, it's there for that purpose. Amen? And then there's Adam. Adam is a type of Jesus insofar as he was a representative man. He represented the entire human race. His screw-up cost everybody. We all pay because of him. He was representative of humanity. And because of that, God allowed that to pass right on down from one generation to the next generation. He had dominion. He had authority. And he used it. And, it was, and all of his progenity, all of his offspring and, 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 uh, and heritage after would be, suffer it, the results of it. 
Now, he wasn't a type in his, in, in, in his disobedience, but he was a type because of the way it affected all of humanity. Right? Amen. Jesus, the, the human representative, the second Adam, has the obverse effect. See what I'm saying? The fulfillment is he satisfies. He completes. He fulfills. He, 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 he wasn't the type, like uh, I said with uh, uh, Adam, he wasn't a type in, in, in his sin or its evil consequences, but he was a type in the consequences of his act affecting all of humanity. Right? All right, Noah's Ark. Jesus' cross. You know, both of them are wood, right? But they don't in themselves produce a type fulfillment. Right? I mean, they not just in the cross or the boat. I mean, the fact that they're wood. That's really not the issue. You understand what I'm saying? On the other hand, Peter says that the flood was a type of baptism. But, except for the water, there's no outward resemblance. Amen? I mean, the boat didn't sink. The boat didn't go under the water, Right? So think about it. Noah and his family, they weren't literally baptized in the flood at all. They weren't in the water, praise the Lord. But there's a deeper uh, resemblance here. The flood destroyed the corrupt from the earth and saved the righteous for a new and better beginning. Right? So baptism signifies God's work of grace cleansing us and giving us a new beginning, new creatures. That's the type that he's using. It isn't so much the water, you understand what I'm saying, as it is the type of what baptism is. Praise the Lord. And that's why baptism itself does not save. Why? Because that's not an act of faith. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying you shouldn't be baptized. I'm saying... There are people who think that just you get baptized and then everything's done. Well, they're not, they're not exercising faith in what baptism represents. They're just being baptized because they were told to be baptized. Right. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you believe, if you understand the typology, then you recognize this is about death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. This is about old things passed away, corrupt has been taken care of, and I'm a new creature in Christ. Yeah. That's faith. That's exercising faith. That's what all of these acts are about. They're about establishing faith. They're types. They're real, but they're trying to show us how God wants us to live our lives so that we get the benefits. So I say a church, an empty church, is nothing more than a type. Amen? Mike's talked about hunger, emptiness. He said, you know, if, if you really understood your hunger... You'd ask of me, and I would give you the bread of life. You know, if you really understood thirst, you wouldn't be looking for a bucket here. You'd just ask of me, and I'd give you a river that would not only satisfy you, but out of you, out of your belly, out of your spirit, man, would flow a river that would satisfy everybody you come into contact with. They're types, but they're there for a purpose, and the purpose is for our faith. For us to believe that God is greater than the circumstance. He's greater than our the, whatever the opposition is. Greater than whatever the long-term nagging thing. If you can exercise your faith in him, you'll be saved. Not just saved from hell, but saved from the circumstance. Saved from the situation. Saved from the from the financial thing. Saved from the relational thing. Saved from the, the sickness. Saved from whatever it is. It all works the same way. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. That's all God's ever wanted. That's all he's ever wanted. Why? Because he wants to show himself mighty on your behalf. But we limit him by our traditions. And so he looks like a weak God. He looks like a little God. He looks like a, uh, maybe a God, maybe not a God. But that's because of the way we have perceived and the way we have presented. Just believe God. 
and watch what happens. Amen? So now, I, we don't have to go here, but I just I would encourage you to read sometime. Hebrews uh, chapters 3 and 4 is all talking about Israel, obviously, because it's written to the, he, to the Hebrews. But it's about the Canaan rest and how it's compared to a greater rest of the believer. Now, there was a promised land. There was a, a Canaan rest. But it's nothing like the, 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 the fulfillment. You understand what I'm saying? Those are always lesser. I mean, there are some, of, some people even today in the church that would just like to have that. You know, a house, a vineyard, you know, some land. Come on, man. That's nothing compared to what. That's just a little thing to get them to believe God, to show the, what faith in God can do. There's something far greater that God wants to do and something far greater that God has done for us. Amen? There is a greater rest for us and also eternal punishment of the unbelieving rebels is greater than the loss of earthly rest. We, we, we read in uh, Ephesians 4 and 2, I think it is, you know, they didn't get the promise and so on and so forth. They lost, they lost their, their uh, earthly rest. But that's nothing in compared to losing eternal rest. That's the pic that it's a greater picture that he's trying to show. Just like the, the, uh, the earthly rest that they got is nothing in comparison to the rest that we have in Christ. Think about it. They still had to go through all those rituals even though they were about faith. Praise the Lord. God has done it all. And all we do is rest in Him. And the anointings of the Old Testament, they all prefigured the work of Christ. And we as Christians have an anointing from God, and we also function as prophets, foretellers of God's Word. Amen. Christ. Everybody's a prophet. Everybody is a priest. Everybody is a foreteller of the Word. That's, what a, that's really what a prophet is. And Jesus Christ is the Word. And you reveal Him. A lot of times, without opening your mouth. I mean, in fact, sometimes for some people, it's better to not open your mouth because I'm thinking about people talking about, you know, Mahatma Gandhi said this about Christians. He said, I would have been a Christian if I hadn't listened to him. I mean, he understood the teachings of Christ to the degree that it was about grace and mercy and love, forgiveness, and he, he embraced that. But then he went to church. <laughs> and that was the end of that. Praise the Lord. We need to represent God faithfully. And I don't mean that by just do, 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 do. I mean faithfully by being honest about his love. We don't want to be Jonah's. You ever heard that expression? I used to work with a guy all the time. He said, man, he's a Jonah. You know, it's like bad luck. You don't want to be around him. But Jonah was just, he was, he was mean. He was very exclusive. And that, therefore, made God look exclusive and mean. Amen? God is inclusive and loving. And you want to be faithful to represent God. That's what you need to be. Amen. Look, I, I, I tell you something just off the side here. I had a really awkward situation come up. And uh, about a, I don't want to get into it because I don't know who watches this. I don't want all that stuff out there. But it was just an unusual thing. And something's happening. There's a celebration deal going on. And it's something that I don't agree with. You know, and I don't think it's biblical. And yet, I know these people. You know, I care about them. So I had a choice. I could have just ignored the whole thing and just disregarded the invitation, the whole thing, and just said, I don't want nothing to do with it. Or I could have written some ugly letter about how evil it is, what you're doing. But instead, I found a kind of generic card and 
sent some money and said, God bless you, and may you always experience his favor. And I told Sally, I said, you know what, I'm just going to trust Jesus about this. This has got nothing to do with my personal feelings or even my interpretation of Scripture. But if this person, these people, ever come to really know Christ, somebody's going to have to act like Jesus. Somebody's going to have to quit beating them over the head with the Bible and just say, you know, God loves you. And leave it in God's hands. I'm not endorsing. I'm not condemning. I'm not saying. I'm just saying, you know what? Hey, I, that's what I think Jesus did with prostitutes, with drunkards, with tax collectors. You know, we don't have to take the responsibility of being the Holy Ghost. We don't have to judge every act that everybody commits. We ought to just love them and leave it in his hands. He's the ultimate judge. But if I'm going to represent God, I'm not, I'm not running around, I'm not going to go, you know, getting a, celebrating, doing, yes, this is good, and, you know, you should do all this, whatever it is that it might be, you, that's, you know, a sin, quote, unquote. But I don't see Jesus, you know, having a problem with sinners. His problem was the way that he was being represented by the religious people. And he had to go to extremes to reach people and express the true picture or image of God so that people could exercise faith so that they could get the results that God wanted them to have in the first place. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We are priests and kings. Amen? Amen. So, again, I'm, I'm finishing right now. Uh, on the surface, it looks like there's a big difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, at times and for a long time, I really did believe that we're talking two different religions. I thought, well, this is for the Jews, this is for the Gentiles. You know? But typology helps you see under the surface the difference to essential truth and the unity and the identity of the gospel in both testaments. Amen? Amen. There's the same truth in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that is that God loves us and the only way we can appropriate that is by faith. So he's all about developing faith. And if you understand it, it's a progressive thing because the more you can believe, the more you can believe for. And the more you believe for, the greater your expectation and faith will be for the next blind sighting that the enemy throws at you, right? Yeah. Hallelujah. That word became flesh, the greatest manifestation of trust, right? Mm -hmm. Mary believed God. <laughs> it's that simple, man. I mean, I don't know why that was the fullness of time. Maybe it was just because it was the first time somebody came along that could trust enough for God to perform that tremendous miracle of the virgin birth, right? That's fulfillment. That is the fulfillment of all of the types of the Old Testament. God comes in the flesh as Jesus, the Savior of humanity. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He wants to save you tonight out of whatever it is that's holding you. You know what? You know, I mean, it has the vice on your head about, I, I just, you know, I've believed for, for so long, and it just hasn't happened. Don't believe a little longer. It will happen. It has to happen because everything in the Word of God declares it. It must be. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Faith is what it's all about. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Faith in Jesus, the fulfillment of every type. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Believe God. Expect miracles. Hallelujah. And watch them happen. Praise the Lord.